Commuter or regional rail in the United States is a very interesting topic, as compared to the rest of the world. While Europe has the RER in France and Belgium, S-Bahn in Germany, and London's extensive commuter rail networks, and Asia's sprawling services in Japan, India, and China, America is just a little bit behind. For a country the size of the United States, it seems astounding that only 10 services serve more than 10 million trips per year by pre-pandemic numbers. Among these include the expansive Northeast systems of New Jersey Transit, Long Island Railroad, and Metro North, as well as MBTA's commuter rail up in Boston. But in California, there's one that operates on the San Francisco Peninsula that has gained much prominence in recent years. Today, I'll take you on a brief tour of Caltrain and why its modernization project may well have turned it into the best commuter rail in the country. Welcome to D-Transit and to my series on California transit systems. After spending four months living and exclusively using the transit in the Bay Area, I feel obligated to share what I've learned with all of you. If you haven't yet seen it, be sure to check out my previous video where I talk about BART and its transformation over the past few years. Today's focus is Caltrain, the primary rail link serving the San Francisco Peninsula and Silicon Valley. Caltrain is composed of a singular line, running from San Francisco 4th and King Street Station to Tamian in San Jose, with rush hour service through to Gilroy. Like every other transit entity in California, Caltrain is governed by a joint powers board of the counties that it serves. Santa Clara, San Francisco, and San Mateo counties come together to form the Peninsula Corridor Joint Powers Board, or PCJBP. Most rail services in California are overseen by joint power authorities, encouraged by the state of California to help oversee funding, support, and collective initiatives that benefit the entire line. Caltrain traces its origins to the San Francisco and San Jose Railroad, who built the right-of-way in 1853. Southern Pacific purchased the route in 1870 and double-tracked it, providing service until 1980. At that point, during the nationwide decline of rail service, California's Department of Transportation, or Caltrans, began subsidizing Southern Pacific service to assist in expenses, and upgraded stations and added shuttle buses to provide last mile transit to employers in the area, dubbing the operation Caltrain. 1987 saw the formation of the Peninsula Corridor Joint Powers Board to manage the line. Soon after, the JBP bought the railroad right-of-way between San Francisco and San Jose and took responsibility of all operations, eventually handing off operating duties as a contract to Amtrak. PCJVP also extended Caltrain from San Jose to Gilroy via Tamian, but did not purchase the right-of-way for this section. Tamian to Gilroy remains under the ownership of Southern Pacific. For nearly all of its history, Caltrain operated diesel equipment leased from Southern Pacific, repainted in Caltrain colors, alongside three types of passenger cars, their trademark Nippon Chario gallery cars, Bud single-level rail diesel cars, and their Bombardier bi-level cars. The Nippon Chario and Bud cars have since been retired, but their Bombardier fleet remains active on the San Jose Derridon to Gilroy portion of their route. After the turn of the century, Caltrain more than doubled its passenger count. 29,700 passengers rode the line every weekday in 2000, while at its peak in 2018, more than 65,000 people took Caltrain on weekdays, according to its ridership reports. At the height of its success, Caltrain has a 74% fare box recovery ratio, which was seen in 2016. As I mentioned in my last video, the fare box recovery ratio is the fraction of the revenue made through passenger ticket sales over the expenses of the operation. 74% is an incredibly high and in the US, unusually high percentage. Systems like the MTA Metro North in New York and Connecticut achieves a 60% ratio, while New Jersey's NJ Transit barely scrapes 40. A high fare box recovery ratio is great during normal operation. Most of the expenses are covered by fares, which means government grants can be redirected towards capital improvement projects. But just like the rest of the country, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, Caltrain's ridership dropped hard. 2021 saw barely 20,000 people take Caltrain, resulting in a 19% fare box recovery ratio. But Caltrain before the pandemic wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. Yes, it was an extremely reliable way to travel in an area devoid of almost any BART service barring north of Millbrae. But it was slow, taking long amounts of time to accelerate and decelerate, adding to its trip times. Its inability to stop, coupled with the over 30 grade crossings as a result of the line, resulted in numerous fatalities as people were struck by the train. 
At the end of the diesel fleet's life, a scientist took it upon himself to measure the concentration of pollutants in the air, resulting from the diesel-powered trains. The results showed air inside the gallery cars to be just as bad as the air in New Delhi during peak traffic, and even worse on the outside while trains sat idle. Here's where the exciting stuff begins. To combat these issues, Caltrain underwent the Caltrain Modernization Program, or CalMod for short. In total, it was a $2.5 billion project that added a positive train control system and electrified the segment of the line running from San Francisco to San Jose. For those unfamiliar with the subject, positive train control is a safety system utilized by trains to prevent collisions and derailments. Each train, fitted with a GPS and an active screen, continuously relays information back and forth to rail operation centers and other trains. Through this, train operators can set danger zones where a train can't go, or speed limits if something has affected normal service. Removing the analog style of reporting danger not only makes the system safer, but also allows trains to run closer together and with a higher efficiency because of the continuous and updating relay of information. The electrification portion of the line was arguably the more game-changing aspect. Caltrain electrification plans began as early as 1992, but never took shape because of a lack of funding. A lot of this was down to the issue of California's high-speed rail project. I'll make a separate video about it, but California's high-speed rail project is an underdevelopment high-speed rail connecting Los Angeles and San Francisco. In short, the CHSR needed a route into San Francisco, but Caltrain refused to let the high-speed rail access its tracks. Because CHSR is one of the most highly funded projects in California's government right now, Caltrain denying access to its tracks zapped the electrification process of any possible funding. In 2017, the High Speed Rail Authority and Caltrain came to an agreement whereby the High Speed Rail Authority would fund a portion of the electrification in exchange for usage of the Caltrain tracks. With all the interruptions out of the way, all that was left was for the Department of Transportation to give the go-ahead, with all funding sources secured. But then Secretary of the U.S. DOT Elaine Chao blocked the grant on recommendation from Republican House Leader Kevin McCarthy. After numerous conversations with California representatives, including Governor Jerry Brown and Senators Feinstein and Harris, May, on May 23rd, Secretary Chow and the FTA signed the funding grant, giving Caltrain the go-ahead sign to continue the project. Over the next few years, the 65,000 rider per day Caltrain ran modified schedules, so to allow construction to begin on building the catenary structures, beginning in Millbrae, near San Francisco Airport. Caltrain also completed their order for their new rolling stock from Switzerland-based Stadler Rail. The current locomotives were purely diesel and didn't have pantographs, and were due a huge upgrade. On August 10, 2024, Caltrain ran its first official run of the Stadler Kiss on its new electrified mainline, with Governor Newsom, FRA Chair Amit Bose, and Senator Padilla amongst the riders. A day later, revenue service began, marking a huge day in Caltrain's history. Fast forward to today, and riders have been raving about Caltrain. The new Stadler Kiss EMUs are an incredibly welcome improvement over the diesel locomotives and gallery cars of yesteryear. One of the most notable impacts has been the increase in acceleration from the EMUs, wherein each car accelerates rather than a push-pull style seen with diesel engines. The acceleration is so immense that it can even put Northeast Corridor trains to shame, and shaves off upwards of 15% of time from the total trip. This also allows Caltrain to run more services, and the addition of PTC lets them run trains closer together. The EMUs themselves feature more seating than the gallery cars did, more space for luggage on the lower floor, and USB and Wi-Fi services throughout the entire train. Caltrain has absolutely turned itself around, but problems still arise with the system. The most highlighted one is the lack of easy accessibility to the Caltrain stations. Many riders turn away from Caltrain because the train ride itself is shorter than getting to and from the station and their destination. While some of the stations are near the centers of the peninsula towns, most are upwards of 5 to 10 miles away from office districts, proving problematic for riders who want to take Caltrain but don't see the feasibility in it. To combat this, Caltrain has undertaken multiple transit-oriented development projects. Transit-oriented development, or TOD, 
is development that concentrates on the public transport as the center of the frame. From there, corporate offices, residential areas, and commercial shops are built strategically to enhance the walkability of the area and reduce dependency on cars. But all in all, Caltrain has done a tremendous job. The system wasn't particularly bad pre-pandemic, but it wasn't reliable, clean, or efficient. The complete overhaul of rolling stock combined with the electrification gives Caltrain a certain breath of fresh air that reminds me of what Bart felt when they completed the rollover of their train cars. Granted, Caltrain ridership is still barely 40% of what it was before the pandemic, which overall is attributed to the work from home culture that the Bay has adopted. But from 2023 to 2024, ridership has increased by at least 25% on weekdays and more than 85% on weekends. The weekend increase should be particularly encouraging. This means that more and more people are choosing Caltrain to go places instead of sticking to the freeways. Thank you for watching today's video on Caltrain. If you enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Drop your thoughts on Caltrain in the comments below. If you're interested in learning more about transit developments on the smaller scale, be sure to tune into my This Week in Transit series, where I review the biggest news in transit every Wednesday. Thanks for watching.